Right, this is case number one. You guys have been doing this, so we're going to show you on a design sheet how I would do it. Now, from a, a sketching point of view, you should sketch out the teeth that are missing rather than, so I'd rather hash them out. I'm trying to get this in the shot. So we've got a missing five, six on this side, and on the other side, we've got missing four and five. So if you hash them out like that, it shows as missing. You do a cross on a tooth, it implies it's an immediate addition, so extraction. So if you do that, that looks like a tooth's going to be extracted. So just hash them out and then outline the saddles. I draw a big enough flange that you can actually show the technician where the, the clasp is going to come from. So that's where you start. Hashed out teeth, two saddles. The first thing you need to do is, is support. And I think we're doing supports in red. So you should do each saddle individually. So we're going to do a saddle on this side to support this saddle. Now, cingulum rest on the canine can come in from the side. It doesn't need to be from the palatal extension. So you support one saddle. We've got another saddle up here, so we can do exactly the same here. Kugel rest on the premolar and Kugel rest on the molar. So you've supported all your saddles before you go to the next stage. Next stage, you need some retention on this. Now, if you've got a short span saddle, you've got the option of clasping anteriorly or posteriorly. Now, on the, on the patient's left side, you've got undercuts on the canine and on the molar. So you could clasp either or both. So for argument's sake, let's clasp the molar as well. Now, as soon as you clasp a tooth, you should know by now, you put reciprocation on. You can decide if it's plate or arm afterwards, but draw a line on the inside of the tooth to show you understand the significance of reciprocation. So I potentially put a clasp on this tooth just for completion. If the patient didn't like it and you've clasped the molar, you can then dispense with that one. Now this is reciprocated by the action of this um, cingulum rest, so it doesn't matter. You don't need a separate reciprocation. That's big enough to counter the action of the clasp. Same on this side. And interestingly, if we look at the molar here, this is a dreadful impression and we've got no buccal detail at all. So send the impression back to the dentist, retake the impression. But in this case, we're not going to put a clasp on there because you've got no detail. By the book, you'd send that back and ask for another impression. So now we've got support everywhere. We just need to reciprocate both these teeth and you can see the canine is reciprocated. Let's make that a bit bigger just for clarity. So both these gingerly approaching clasps are reciprocated by the action of the clasp on the, uh, the uh, wing on the palatal aspect. All we've got to do now is join it up. Now gingerly free. So you can bring the denture base down here and you can bring it, spread some load across the palate and come back up here. So the option here, everybody seems to like making um, ring connectors, so we can come down here, denture base can come back, bring the denture base away from the gingival tissues and bring it in there. If you want to do a ring connector here, you can because it's not a free end saddle. Now in the real world, if you're going to clasp this upper molar here, which you might do, if the clasp were less visible you could do that, but then you'd need some reciprocation plate or arm. In this case, you can't see the size of the tooth, but the premolar there, you could put an arm as a reciprocation. And certainly the molar tooth here, you've got plenty of height, so that could be arm reciprocation as well. So that's your denture base. And that's what it would look like. All you've got to do then is just shade in the metal work to show that's what the denture base looks like. So to check your design at the end, you check you've got the saddle supported at both ends, as is this one. You've got the uh, clasp on both these teeth, which are visible. That's the only downside. And if the patient didn't like this clasp, you could omit that and use the molar clasp at the back there. So that's the Kennedy class three case, upper partial denture. Right, lower arch, case number one. So bilateral bounded saddles, easy case. So as I said before, you hash out the teeth that are missing. So in this case here, we've all we've effectively got is the six missing. So we just shade that out. As I say, if you put a hash line across it, it could be ex uh, extraction. And on this side, again, we've got a molar missing and the other molars drifted forward. Okay, so stage one. Now, you don't need the model for a minute, just outline the saddles. Now on lowers, if the saddle can be acrylic lingually, if you have to adjust it, it's really easy. If you make the saddle metal lingually, it's way more difficult. If you've got an overextension there, you've got a big problem adjusting it. If it's acrylic, it's easy. If it's chrome, it's a nightmare. 
So let's support this now. So short span saddle, the molar here is measly drifted and lingually drifted. So if you don't load the tooth axially, you're not doing the maximum support. So load this one distally because of the angulation. And again, the, the five is drifted back a bit. So again, if we load this measly with the rest, so now we've loaded that saddle, you've got axial loading through both those teeth. These are dependent on the occlusal clearance, but we're assuming it's okay. On this side, this tooth has also drifted slightly, so we're gonna do the same thing again, just to be on the same side, rest, rest distally. And the premolar's pretty upright, but again, I think just to be on the safe side. You've now supported both the saddles. Now you can clasp. So you've got the option of clasping anteriorly or posteriorly. Anterior teeth clasped are going to look a bit ugly. If you've got the option of a molar posteriorly, clasp the molar. Both of these teeth have got mesolingual undercut, so both lend themselves to clasps going lingually. So in this case, we're going to put a clasp around here. If you're going to reciprocate that, you're going to need a buccal arm. So as the tooth lent in, we can bring an arm around the buccal aspect, and that will stabilise the denture. Same on the other side. We've got a mesolingual undercut. And when you draw the clasps, if you draw half an arrowhead, it shows you and it shows the technician where the clasp tip ends. If you do two arms, you won't use colour pens one day. So if you do two arms, if you indicate retention by this arrowhead, it's much clearer to the technician than if you just do two arms. So now we've probably got enough retention there. If you were to put clasps on the premolars, they're going to look a bit ugly. You could put clasps there, but it's not going to be very pretty. The patient's not going to appreciate it. If you've got two molar clasps here, you've got bounded saddles, you've got contact points, you'll have great retention. So you probably don't need any more clasps. If you clasp the premolars, you'd have to reciprocate as well. You don't really need to. So saddles are supported, you've got loads of retention. You've now got to join up both sides of the arch. So you've got sufficient lingual depth, probably, to get a lingual bar in. Lingual bars are healthy, as you guys should know by now. Major connector. Lingual plate, not so healthy. Lingual bar, perfect. So just bring this round, draw it away from the model, follow the contour. Don't forget there's a tongue here you can't go straight across as somebody did this morning. No names mentioned because I don't know the name. So okay, lingual bar, major connector. Now I, in addition, would probably add a couple of lingual arms on the pre-motors just in case if one of these class failed here and you had an arm there You've got to join the rest of the rest of the denture base anyway. So you've got a lingual arm. Again, clinical crown height sufficient. So you can use lingual arms, not plate, to keep it gingerly free. So you've got an arm coming around there, which is a main minor connector as well. It joins the rest to the denture base. These are rests, not rest seats. Rest seats are preparations in teeth. Rests are the component parts of the denture. So that's the second case. Really nice, straightforward. Bounded saddle is the perfect denture base should last forever. Okay, so here we've got case number eight, which I think has been a problem for lots of people. Kennedy class four, uh, this is difficult. So first thing we do is gonna uh, hash out the missing teeth as we did earlier on. So all we've got is missing two central incisors here. So we just hash these out as missing. And what you need to be aware of here is what's gonna keep this denture in. Now the flange is going to keep the denture in because it's going to engage the soft tissue undercut and the contact points which you're going to get here and here will provide retention anteriorly so that's the flange so the most of the retention is anterior what you wouldn't do is gingerly approach and clasp backwards from this flange because they would look awful and the patient would probably almost certainly be less than pleased so first thing you need to do is get some support for this otherwise the saddle is going to sink now some schools of thought would suggest that just covering the lateral will be big enough for support. If you don't support this, this anterior saddle will sink. So, and some people may say, oh, the laterals aren't big enough. So in that case, if the occlusion is compatible, you may actually extend the support onto the canines. This would be totally dependent on the occlusion. But for argument's sake, for what we're doing here, we're gonna say this is gonna work. So you've now got maximum support for that anterior saddle. So the saddle won't sink and it's retained anteriorly by the option of the, the flange engaging the soft tissue undercut and the two mesial contact points on the two is touching the denture. What you want to do now is stop this denture dropping. So this denture will drop. The front of the denture will drop down. So you want to put some clasps engaging quite a long way back and the undercuts on the sixes, of which there are none, so you'd have to prep them. So both the sixes we're going to use neither have undercuts, so you'd have to deal with that 
as a separate issue. But we'll engage mesial undercuts on both these molars, so we're going to bring the clasp this way around. Half arrowhead implies its retentive tip. Now you'd need to annotate this ordinarily, but if you're doing this for a, a denture in an exam situation, you'd have to label this prep some sort of undercut, okay? The same applies here. So you need to make some sort of undercut to make these clasps effective. Okay, so if you clasp a tooth, you know you have to reciprocate, so we're going to bring an arm around here to counter the action of the, of the clasp. The clinical crown height is probably just about enough you could do that. And if it wasn't, you might do plate. So if you're going to clasp a tooth, you have to provide support, otherwise the clasp will migrate towards the gingival margin and cause gingival trauma. So we do rests. So now we've got a supported saddle, we've got some retention there, you've got to join it up. You want to keep this gingerly free so the denture base comes along here. And if you bring a minor connector up mid cingulum, it keeps the interdental papilla area clear. So the same along here. Denture base is clear of the gingival margins but deriving some support. And then you just have a denture base that comes along here, like so. If you wanted and the pallet was big enough, you could make a ring connector. If the pallet was quite small, you may just leave it all in chrome. So there's the denture base, acrylic anteriorly supporting the teeth. So Kennedy class four, not easy. Don't clasp anteriorly because it's just plain ugly. So the patient would probably be okay with that. You need occlusal clearance for the rest. You need occlusal clearance for the arm coming through, but that's prep again. So you need to prep the undercuts on these two teeth. That's case eight. Right here we have case number five. Unilateral free-end saddle with an additional saddle. So, as ever, block out the missing teeth. Remember, the saddle's going to go back as far as the retromolar pad, even if you're not going to put eights on it, you still hash out what's missing. So we've got no molars and we've got lower, lower first premolar. So on this side, we've lost the six. We're going to call that a seven for argument's sake, and we'll say the eight's missing. Now, we're not going to replace the eight, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so the saddles. We have one here. And as we said before, make the lingual part of the saddle acrylic, not chrome. It's easier to adjust. This is a free end saddle and it's going to go as far back as the retromolar pad. So draw it full size. Okay, two saddles. First thing you want is support. Now we've got a measly inclined molar. So we're going to have to rest distally to axially load the tooth. The premolar is rotated a bit, so it's easier to get to the rest on the mesial. So that's purely for ease of access. You can see it's a rotated tooth. It would just lend itself better to a mesial rest. And on the other side, we've got a long freehand saddle. So we're going to rest away because there's probably more bone. And because of the length, we're also going to put an additional rest on the three, which will probably re require composite build-up. So you've now supported as best you can. We're now going to clasp it. So to retain this tooth, there's denture, lower right free end saddle, that undercuts too low. So we're going to place a gingerly approaching clasp, but we're going to have to raise the undercut up. So we are going to ask for a composite to be added. To, to create an undercut. Okay, and the tooth on the other side looks fine. So, as soon as you clasp the tooth, you have to reciprocate. So we're going to bring denture base around there. Uh, short clinical crown like that might end up being lingual plate. We'll decide that in a minute. On the other side, we really need to retain. Now, we've got best undercut usually on mo lower molars is mesolingual. So the undercut's bigger, so we're going to engage an undercut here. Half an arrow head shows the lab where you want the retentive tip. It doesn't can then confuse because quite often you draw these up in one colour. So we need buckle bracing now to reciprocate the action of the class. We bring an arm around the buckle aspect. So that's now going to reciprocate and add buckle bracing. Do you want to add a clasp on the premolar? It's probably unnecessary, but if you were to do it, it's not breaking the law. Injury approaching clasp, a single rooted tooth. You won't get a long enough arm to be flexible. 13 millimetres in theory is the arm length. So if it's going to be single arms, this is gingerly approaching, which will be longer. Reciprocate. That's done. Now you've just got to join it up. Now you need to join that to rest together. We suspect, because of the short clinical crown light here, this is going to have to be 
plate that far. So we're now going to do the same on this side, short clinical crown. So unfortunately, we're going to do plate again. So a major connector can be a lingual bar otherwise to keep it gingerly free. So this is all metal. The lingual plate major connector. Now your concern now is your indirect retention. You've now got a fulcrum axis because this tooth clasp is optional. We've got a fulcrum axis through here. So if we draw a bisecting line, your indirect retention anti-rotation needs to be at 90 degrees roughly for the bisecting line. So here you've got an area of indirect retention. So maybe you would just put an additional rest on this premolar tooth because you've already got a lingual plate there and that's probably close enough to there to give it indirect retention at the same time. So that is case number five unilateral free end saddle with an additional saddle. Okay, case number six, bilateral free end saddle. So that's the first thing we do, as you know, is to hash out the missing teeth. Lower right, we have no molars. So we're not gonna replace the eights, but we're still gonna shade out the area because the denture base is gonna go back as far as the retromolar pad. So no molars. On the other side, we have a missing five as well. No second premolar, so the saddle's a bit longer. So, hash out the missing teeth. So it looks like a free end saddle on the design sheet. We're now gonna draw in the saddle. So, make the saddle nice and big, nice and obvious. Lingually, it's all acrylic. Same on this side. Okay, we need some support. So, on this side we have two premolars, so we're gonna utilize both the premolar teeth. Rest on the distal of the four, mesal of the five. On the other side, we've only got one premolar, one occlusal surface, so we're going to use the four. I'm going to build up a cingulum rest seat in composite and the canine. Now we've got support, you need some retention. So we're going to do gingerly approaching clasp because they're single rooted teeth. We can do a half T shape here so it's less visible, just as effective, and the same on this side. So these clasp arms are going to be a minimum 13 millimetres long, which is fine. And we need to reciprocate. Clinical crown height is very good on both these premolar teeth, so there's no reason why we can't do arms to keep it gingerly free. Now we're going to bring an arm around here, and that will link both those rests to the denture base, and we're going to bring an arm around here, which will then also link there. So we've got arm reciprocation for those two teeth. Now we just need to join it up now to make the denture base rigid. So we bring a lingual bar all the way around, which is rigid, non-flexible. Okay, so there we have your major connector and lingual bar. Now the biggest issue you've got here, Kennedy class one lowers are probably the least worn dents you can make for anybody because they move. So you can see we've got plenty of depth for lingual bar, so it's not an issue, but we have the issue of anti-rotation, indirect retention. So you've created a fulcrum axis by clasping those two canines, so two premolars, so we've got Rotation, anti-rotation is an issue, so we've got rotational issues around that line. So for maximum efficiency, we need to bisect the, the line and where the line crosses rigid teeth, we need support. So this is how to stop the denture rotating. Now, just to do it on two teeth like that, there's a risk that you'll procline these teeth. So this is where we use the Kennedy bar and we're gonna come all the way around here to provide maximum anti-rotation. So this is a high bar, it's off the gingival margins and it's all the way around these teeth. The problem with this is they tend to fracture if you're not careful, so you need a mid strut. You want a span of no longer than five or six teeth. So you do a mid strut there, which means the span is fairly short there and fairly short there, no more than four teeth. That way the denture base will transmit the load to the indirect retainer and stop the denture flexing and the paste is more like to wear it. So that is design number five, six.